Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk. I'm Julio, and this is my colleague, Lee. Hello, everyone. So in the next 20 minutes or so, we will present our work on alternative phenomenal items together. We will comparatively look at two languages, Vietnamese and Chinese, and we will share our findings with you. We begin by taking a look at the default or textbook pronouns. These are items like English, I, you, and German, ich, du, etc. Such pronouns have basic referential functionality and sometimes also additional honorific functionality, as we can see in examples 1a and 1b. In 1a, the English pronoun I simply refers to the speaker. And in 1b, the German pronoun Z with capital S refers to the address C in a polite way. Such pronouns are what we usually see in textbooks or reference grammars, but we wanna highlight that they are not the only pronominal items out there. One type of alternative pronominal item is what Collins and Postal call the imposter, which is also known as the third person substitute in yes person's terms. An imposter looks like an ordinary R expression or referring expression and is also subject to third person agreement but it semantically refers to the speaker or the address C instead of a third person. For example, in 2a, daddy is going to get you an ice cream cone. Here, daddy actually means I, that is the speaker. And in 2b, is the general going to dine in his suit? The general actually means you, which is the address C. There are many more imposters in English, such as yours truly, this reviewer, etc. And basically, we can say that imposters are our expressions that are employed to refer to the speaker or the addressee. Outside Europe, imposters also abound in Asian languages like Vietnamese and Chinese. And in both languages, commonly used imposters include king terms, career titles, and personal names. For example, in three and four, the Vietnamese king term, mom, me, and the career title, teacher, tai, are used to refer to the speaker, while the personal name Ling in five is used to refer to the addressee. Similarly, in the Chinese examples six and seven, the kin term mom, mama, and the career title teacher, lao shi, also refer to the speaker. And the personal name Ling Ling in eight also refers to the addressee. A crucial point to note here is that the actual reference of these Vietnamese and Chinese imposters are all contextually determined. So in three, the kin term mom is glossed as first person singular because it is uttered by a mother to her child. But the same sentence can be said by a child to his mother as well. And in that case, the same kin term mom will get a second person referent instead. Imposters like these are highly common in Vietnamese and Chinese, but they are still not all there is to pronominal items in human language. So apart from imposters, we also notice a second type of alternative pronominal item. We use the term non-canonical here because this type has not been properly studied or even documented before, although it is gaining popularity on the internet. Let's look at two examples first. In the Vietnamese example here, the word mi is used to refer to the speaker. So instead of saying, I swear, I don't feel upset, this person says, me swear, me don't feel upset, which sounds very funny. Me is originally the name of a character in an old literary work, but nowadays it has gained a new pronoun-like use on the internet. Similarly, in Chinese, there's an ancient royal term, ai jia, which literally means mourner and was used by empress dowagers, that is, empress mothers, to refer to themselves, at least in literary works, that is. Nowadays, this term has also been revived on the internet. For example, this person says, they just don't give mourner any time, and no one told mourner. Again, the use of mourner makes the sentence very funny. There are still many more such items in Vietnamese and Chinese, which we will show later. Here, we just want to emphasize that unlike imposters, non-canonical pronominal items typically do not have flexible reference nor do they have common art expression usage. So both Vietnamese mi and Chinese ai jia can only be used to refer to the speaker, but cannot be used to refer to the address C or some third person. 
So imposters and non-canonical phenomenal items differ in quite a few aspects. Imposters have been widely used for a long time. They are prevalent in many languages. They have flexible reference and common art expression usage, and they are mainly recycled from nouns that are in contemporary usage. By comparison, non-canonical phenomena items are an emerging phenomenon and limited to certain registers, mainly on the internet. They are typologically much less prevalent, they have fixed reference and no common art expression usage, and they have miscellaneous lexical sources. Given these non-canonical characteristics, we think this new type of phenomenal item deserves more careful investigation, which is what we do in our study. Specifically, we have four main goals in our study. First, we will observe non-canonical phenomenal items in Vietnamese and Chinese in more detail. Second, we will refine the cross-linguistic phenomenal item taxonomy. Third, we will compare Vietnamese and Chinese alternative phenomenal items more generally. And fourth, we will incorporate alternative phenomenal items, especially non-canonical ones, in a unified syntactic theory. In this presentation, we focus on the first two goals due to time limit, and the third and fourth goals will be dealt with in our paper. Before I hand over to Lee, I want to show you a preliminary taxonomy in relation to our second goal. So, phenomenal items fall in two groups based on how they are used, the default group and the alternative group. And alternative phenomenal items fall in two further subtypes, imposters and non-canonical phenomenal items. All right, now I'll hand over to Lee to tell you more about what we have found. Great, thank you Julio for a very helpful summary. So I will start with the first subtype of the non-canonical pronominal items in Vietnamese. So I dubbed this subtype the me type, which typically involves all literary character names that have been revived in modern usage. Some terms in this group include me, which is the first person singular pronominal item, which is originally a character name in an old Vietnamese novel or dam, an archaic first person singular pronominal item, which literally means emperor, which were borrowed from the widespread Chinese historical films in Vietnamese pop culture. And similarly, we also have I Fei, which also share the same borrowing root, but refer to the second person singular only, which literally means the emperor beloved woman. So all of these items are archaic, but they have been revived in recent times at pronominal item with special pragmatic effects. Um, for example, for all of these words here, they use most often in a jocular way. Um, these terms are very popular online and also occasionally used in real life. So Chinese also have a very similar subgroup, which we dub the IJAR type. Um, excuse my pronunciation of Mandarin to um, begin with, but um, so basically we can see from the slide the term uh, ancient royal term that have also been revived in modern usage for specific uh, pragmatic effects. For example, we have Aja here as a first person pronominal item, which were originally used by Empress Dowagers, or Jun or Guoren, um, which originally used by Emperor. Uh, we also have Wang Gong or um, Jin um, here which Ting as a second singular pronominal item originally used by emperors down to, to royal officials. Uh, these items are very popular online, uh, similar to what we saw for Vietnamese, and so they now been used for uh, special pragmatic effects. Um, so to give you some idea of how these terms are actually used, here are some examples of this subtype in Vietnamese and Chinese. I read down the first example here in Vietnamese, Mẹ không hiểu, các chị hiểu không? Um, here you can see that the item Mẹ is used the first person singular in place of a typical pronoun to mean that Mẹ don't understand, to mean I don't understand. And similarly in the Chinese example here, um, the term I just also used the first person singular pronominal item. So in the first example, for example, um, the mathematical word we indicate colorless I da is tired to mean that I am tired. So for both Vietnamese and Chinese, the first person singular item have a chocolatey arrogant tone and are often used by um, female and occasionally male speaker. So moving on to the second subtype, uh, this is what we refer to as the hang type in Vietnamese. 
Um, these are dialectal terms that are more prevalent in real life usage than in the previous subtype. Some examples of this uh, in the Vietnamese include Hang and A here, which are from central, southern, and northern dialects, respectively. Similarly to the first subtype, uh, these, these terms encode very specific pragmatic effects, uh, such as uh, friendly or offensive uh, for Hang, depending on the context, um, and whether it's formal or informal and so on. And the term A in particular is also specific to the legal discourse only, and you see that most prevalently, uh, more prevalently in that domain. So again, we see a matching subtype in Chinese, which are dialect to term. Um, some example here include O, um, E, and Ya. Um, and as we can see from the slide, each of them come from a specific variety of Chinese. Um, these terms enter common Mandarin from dialects via mass media. Um, they're more familiar in real life than the previous subtype, but similarly, they encode special pragmatic effects. For example, you know, for O and E, they using a chocolate tone, but Ya can, can come across it quite vulgar. We similarly presenting some examples of how the terms are used in real life. So I again start with the top example. Đã bao lâu rồi tôi chưa dành những câu từ ngọt ngào cho hắn. Đã bao lâu rồi tôi hồi nhung nhớ về hắn mỗi đêm. So we can see from the gloss slash translation here that the speaker is saying, how long has it been since I said with him to hắn to mean that how long has it been since I said with him to him. Um, and the, the hắn item here has a resentful tone. Similarly, in the Chinese example, if we look at the bottom one, um, I start with that because that's the shorter one. We can see that the speaker could say the eyeball of O to mean the eyeball of mighty um, to achieve a jocularly cute effect. And the same function applied to the, the ya in the middle example on um, to achieve a different effect here. Um, so all these items have a fixed, oops, sorry, all these items have a fixed reference that doesn't depend on context. So the final subtype, which we refer to as the gung group, in Vietnamese, and this subtype are created coinages by market seller and they widespread in the internet era here. Um, they also encode very special effect, uh, such as we can see cute or friendly for gung, um, which literally means dear second person, or friendly, adorable, or offensive, depending on the context and the relationship between the speaker for gong hui, which literally means devil, second person. Um, and we have or flattery and fashionable for ngu, that beautiful person also refer to the second person only. Um, these terms are very creative item and they have no fixed lexical source. We again observe a strikingly similar phenomenon in Chinese with the team type um, also created coinage in the internet era. Um, some example of this group include team um, also mean dear second person coinage by seller on Taobao, which is a shopping website in China, or ban lu or ban shi um, to mean it, to have some sort of sexually self-mocking tone um, or lunja and um, others first person singular. Um, these items also have special pragmatic effects, whether they cute, fashionable, anti-conventional, very similar to what we saw for Vietnamese. Um, and again, they also have no fixed lexical source. They can be very creative. So here we see how this subtype is used in real life. I start with the top example again, which is the one in Vietnamese. So Kung Mung Yi Tu An Now, this is a Facebook status from an online shop seller to ask what do dear want from me to mean what do you want from me? I think what do you want to buy from me? Um, and similarly, we can see this Chinese conversation from Taobao. Um, the seller was saying that dear can save our store to mean you can save our store. Dear are welcome to mean you are welcome. And these second person items are very friendly and very easy going. Um, on the other hand, we, we have other items in this subtype um, as well, for example, con quỷ đang làm gì đó? What is con quỷ doing to mean what are you doing? Um, similarly, in the Chinese example, <clears throat> we can see that recently many people bump into me, which made Lunja feel ashamed to mean which made me feel ashamed for not wearing makeup. Um, and these second person or first person singular item 
sound deliberately adorable in a jocular way in both languages. So in summary, we can see here a striking similarity between Vietnamese and Chinese when it comes to non-canonical pronominal items. Um, these three pronominal subtype in both languages all come from revived old literary character name, dialectal terms or creative coinages on the internet. Um, and the defining three property of these um, terms are default pronoun like syntactic behavior. They have fixed reference. They have no um, R expression usage. They have various additional pragmatic effects, unlike default pronoun, and they have miscellaneous lexical or etymological sources. So what do they mean in the context of our work? I will now hand over back to Julio to continue the discussion. Thank you very much, Li, for the very nice summary. So just now, Li summarized three defining properties of non-canonical pronominal items for us. However, given those properties, we can easily detect a problem in our preliminary taxonomy which is essentially usage-based, of course. So the problem is that default pronouns and non-canonical pronominal items are very far away in this taxonomy, even though they are grammatically very similar, as Li has just shown us. We can resolve the problem by adjusting the taxonomy a bit. So instead of the usage-based perspective, let us propose a syntactically-based perspective instead. First, depending on whether a pronominal item has common R expression usage or not, we can classify it as a true pronoun or an imposter. Next, depending on whether a true pronoun has additional idiosyncratic effects or not, we can further classify it as a default pronoun or a non-canonical pronominal item. And in this new taxonomy, default pronouns and non-canonical pronominal items are adjacent as desired. And accordingly, we can start calling the latter non-canonical pronouns without any hedging because they are syntactically indeed just pronouns. So both default pronouns and imposters have been syntactically studied before, and the main innovation of our study lies in the non-canonical true pronouns instead. Um, we don't have much time to go into the detail here, but Vietnamese and Chinese do have some further differences in the syntax of their imposters, although they are basically the same syntactically in their non-canonical pronouns. In accordance with our observations, we have three theoretical questions to ask. First, what is the syntactic structure of non-canonical pronouns? Second, how can we account for their limited typological distribution? And third, how can we fit the various pronominal items into a grammatical theory of pronouns? All these questions will be answered in our paper, but just to give you a sneak peek, for the first question, we adopt a lexical decompositional approach and derive non-canonical pronouns in the particular version of root syntax. For the second question, we account for the limited typological distribution of non-canonical pronouns by arguing that they are essentially a manifestation of high analyticity. And for the third question, we fit our analysis for non-canonical pronouns into a general theory of pronouns by basically showing that the theoretical framework of previous studies on default pronouns and imposters and the framework we are working in can be nicely integrated, whereby we can have a unified theory for our pronominal item taxonomy. And for more details, please stay tuned for our upcoming paper. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you.